program at the Woodruff School of Nursing at Emory University. She's also affiliated with the um, an affiliate faculty with the Department of Public Depart the Public Health Department within the um, Rowling School of Public Health. And um, she's a fellow in the American Academy of Nursing, and she worked for 18 years as a nurse and, and um, nurse practitioner at La Clinica de la Raza. And I know we've got one person on the call today who's just starting a position there. Um, her research focus has been on health disparities affecting birth outcomes and child development. And she's been uh, a pioneer really in looking at household pollution, particularly from cook fires in low resourced countries. And she is a co-chair of the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments Research Workgroup. She is uh, busy and busy traveling right now. And Lisa, thank, thank you for being patient. And we so um, look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you, Barbara. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're a little bit quiet, but we, we can, we, I think we'll be able to hear you. Okay, let me just see if I can adjust. Oh, that's better. That's better? better? Yeah. Okay, better. and you can you see me? Um, I, I, my, I thought I started my video, but then I can't see myself. So no, just wanna just, check. I just see the fo photo of you, Lisa, but. Okay, well, that's okay. We'll just, we'll just, I'm sorry, I tried to turn on the video and it says it's on. Um, but for some reason, um, I guess it's not. Yeah. So we saw okay. your photograph a second ago, but now it's just a blank screen. Yeah, maybe it's something to do with doing the, um, anyway, the PowerPoint. So um, thanks so much for having me. And um, I also uh, was a faculty member um, at the University of California, San Francisco for seven years um, after I graduated from the University of California, Berkeley. And I have a long uh, 30 years in California before I moved to uh, Atlanta in 2017. So um, I'm really glad that you asked me. I'm very um, following the fires closely. Um, John Balms was actually um, one uh, committee member on my dissertation when I was at Berkeley. So I know him well. And he actually was one of the um, principal investigators of one of the studies in Guatemala that I worked on. So I'm sorry I couldn't be here for all of the presentation, but I was in the field and just spent about four hours in the car getting back here to Guatemala City. So um, I, I chose this photo specifically because it ties into kind of the kind of uh, environment in which we live, where we may uh, cook with a wood stove in our home for heating. And I wanted to just, I have about four slides where I talk about the problem of wood fires globally, which is my primary area of research. So um, ambient, outdoor and household, what we call indoor air pollution, represent the single largest environmental risk factor for ill health globally. And in fact, air pollution, both indoor, as you can see at the top from the cook fire in the house and outdoor, as you can see in the heavy pollution, I think in Delhi, um, contribute to nearly 7 million global premature deaths in 27, 2019. And most of these deaths occur in low and middle income countries where there are low resources, so they can't afford clean stoves. There's a lack of environmental policies and there's an inability to enforce law even if there were policies in place. So this is a picture I took representing household air pollution and it's a major contributor to ambient air pollution because even if you build a chimney stove, the smoke goes outside of the home and actually cooking smoke is been estimated to cause 12% of the outdoor air pollution globally. So it's over 10% you know, of our outdoor air pollution globally is from this exposure. And cooking smoke kills about uh, 500,000 of the 4.2 million premature global deaths from ambient air pollution. So it's, it's a contrib great contributor of lost life. So in 2002, when I was at uh, UC Berkeley as a graduate student working with Kirk Smith, um, we did a study in Guatemala where we provided women who cooked over three stone fires with a randomized chimney stove intervention. And we followed 500 households for two years to see if this chimney stove reduced exposure and thus would reduce childhood pneumonia. And we did see that the stove reduced child exposure by 50% but we were, we were able to reduce pneumonia to 22% in these homes, 
but it was not statistically significant. And that was really because the stove just didn't clean the air enough. Um, it would float outside and into a neighbor's home or it would billow out of the chimney and, you know, in the home. So it, it just wasn't clean enough. And so the reason why I'm here in Guatemala today is because we now have a new trial that will end um, actually in 2022, it's been extended, where we're following 3,200 households in four countries. And one of them is Guatemala and also in India, Peru and Rwanda. And we're providing, we provided pregnant women with an LPG gas stove and a free fuel in those little cylinders like you use for your barbecue um, that were free throughout the 18 month intervention. And the other half of the women continued to use their stoves, whether they were chimney stoves or open fires, uh, because there has never been a study that has been conclusive that this actual cleaning the air to levels low enough to protect health will actually have an effect. And so this study is one of uh, first of its kind, um, and we're looking at low birth weight, infant stunting, and incidence of severe um, pneumonia in children over um, their first month of uh, first year of life. Sorry, so that's our gas stove there in one of the homes, and um, that's just the end of my world of household air pollution. But I, I did want to uh, emphasize because I don't know if John Balms brought it up or not, but. When the fires were going on in California, I got a call from somebody from KQED who wanted me to speak as a nurse about the wildfires. And I said, well, I'm, I'm not in California, I'm in Atlanta. And I actually um, referred them to somebody else, including uh, my, my advisor, Kirk Smith, who passed away last year. And um, he's, uh, you know, he was a bit of a cranky person. And he said, listen, this, what's what you're experiencing and in California is what people experience every day, every day of their life inside their home and outside their home. And, you know, I just wanted to illustrate that this is a, a very major source of exposure for people globally. Um, and it's not to say it's to, to minimize what's happened in California because it's truly, um, you know, terrifying, um, but th this is a problem globally and has been um, since people began to cook over fire. So now I'm gonna to move to indoor air quality in the US context to talk about what we're really talking about in our, in our setting. So we refer to indoor air pollution or household air pollution. We're really talking about people that cook over fires with wood or other um, solid fuels. But indoor air quality in the US context really relates to the health and comfort of building occupants in a, a developed setting. So, this is a typical you know, graphic of a house from the EPA. And I'll, I can share this, the, the sources so you can link on these um, where they actually have a demo. Um, but um, I wanted you to just, just take a minute or two to look at, less than a minute actually, to look at what you see in that home. And then we're gonna have a little quiz on the next, um, try to wake you up a little bit and ask you to interact with me. It's not a test of memory per se, but what I wanted you to, um, I have one more slide before I move to the quiz. <laughs> um, this is a, a survey uh, that was done of over 500 homes where they asked, what is the, describes the, the, your biggest concern about your household's health? And you can see here that almost 70% said that indoor air quality was their biggest concern and it, it, it ranked above other issues, including safety in the neighborhood, or accessibility, um, and now we'll move to the little quiz here. So if you um, go above to the uh, hover above, so you see the drop down menu, you'll see annotate. And if you click on that, you'll see a text selection and you can select the text and I'll just type here. Let's see if it'll work for me. I, didn't, I wasn't able to test this out. There we go. Okay, so you can see I typed air pollution. So you, you would drop down on annotate and you see the little blue T and you click on it and it will appear down here as a written word. So type uh, a common household, uh, something that affects household air quality and you get extra credit if you can tell me where that might be found. Oops. Claire's doing cursive. 
Yeah, you can experiment with your cursive, but if you hit the T for text, you can actually type. Mold, my, okay, Mayela. Um, so, so I don't know if you can see that T for text. It, it so, creates, sorry about that. I, 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 I got it though. I got it. I can see molds <laughs> and green, but the text bo box actually allows you to type in a text box. Oh, do I need to erase it or you can? No, I'm not... I, got, I got mold, but I can't see what J, the, the red. Yeah, there you go. Whoa, excellent, Catherine. Vacuum dust, cat da, da, dander. Wood burning fireplace, everyone can see. Plants decrease air pollution, heat in the main room. Disinfectant sprays. I don't want to write all over, but smoke, uh, like cigarette smoke or marijuana smoke. Well, Good. Cigarettes, cigarette smoke more so. Yep, yeah, you can just call them out if you can't figure out the down, the, the, the typing. Petroleum. Petroleum, okay. Anybody else want to brave brave something before we move on? No, candles, chemicals, chemicals, ozone, candles, ozone. candles. Good formaldehyde. Yes. All right. Radon. Okay. Radon. Perfect. Asbestos. Uh huh. Acetone. Yeah. Lead. Lead. All right. So let me, uh, let me see now what I, I have this test to, of myself to move to the next slide and erase everything. So let's see if I can do that because otherwise we're gonna have this throughout the whole um, presentation. So Karen, do your stat. Hey, Karen, gas stove, yep, clear. Lisa. <laughs> so I'm gonna page down and I'm gonna have to figure out how to clear all this stuff here, clear all drawings, there we go. Whew, okay, I passed my Zoom test. So here you see a house a little bit more pictographically and it shows in the bathroom, you, would, you might encounter more mold because it's moisture, so mildew. You have your cleaning chemicals. The bedroom, we have dust, mites, pet hair, which is spelt incorrectly. The attic, we have asbestos and dust. The living room has carpeting, um, furniture that may be made with wood products that contain formaldehyde tobacco smoke if people smoke indoors and other chemicals from off-gassing of carpets and stuff. Um, the kitchen, we would have the you know, cooking smoke, the uh, chemi cleaning chemicals, carbon monoxide, depending on the stove you're using, um, nitrogen oxides. And then in the garage, depending on where you're located, you could have radon, things that you store in your garage that you probably should get rid of and carbon monoxide. And then anything from the outside that gets in our home like pollen and dust particles are another problem to consider. So not sure how much you got of this earlier and that's one of the disadvantages of not having been here for the whole talk. But um, you know we have a lot of outdoor air pollution that can infiltrate into the house or can, can move into the house. And then once it's in the house, it can react with indoor air pollutants um, and, and either be lost to surfaces through deposition. It can be absorbed into surfaces. There can be chemical reactions that form new pollutants. Um, and these things can be filtered in or filtered out depending on whether you open your windows or not. Um, and then when you walk around on the carpet where things have deposited or absorbed, you can actually um, have off-gassing or resuspension of these um, particles. So all of this means that there's a lot of things to study in the house. It's not just the primary things that are in your home, but it's the chemical reactions that occur inside the home that create new chemicals. Um, so I, I don't have enough time to go through every pollutant that we might encounter inside our home and all the chemical reactions, but I'm gonna focus on some of the most common ones. So airborne particles, and I'm really, again, you know, I, I know that there's been a lot of talk about wildfire and, and all of that, but I'm gonna focus on kind of the other stuff um, and the uh, things that might enter the outside. So if you live near a freeway and diesel exhaust comes into your home, um, if you have, dust from a nearby construction site, if you do have wild smoke that can come into the home where people are smoking inside your home, you will encounter airborne particles. 
I'll talk about indoor formaldehyde and um, some, some about odors and some specific gases. I won't talk too much about ozone because I imagine uh, Dr. Balms did that because he is an ozone expert. And um, I'll talk about carbon dioxide, which I found quite interesting. So when we talk about airborne particles or particulate matter, uh, particulate matter is a carbonaceous particle and onto these particles can adsorb organic chemicals and reactive metals. So even though you have a particle that's made out of carbon, it can contain other things like sulfates, nitrates, endotoxins, heavy metals. Um, and so um, that is, uh, it's not just a simple single particle, it's a complex mix of um, gases and solids. And uh, sources can be both indoor and outdoor. One of the biggest sources is environmental tobacco smoke, which is responsible for approximately 3,000 lung cancer deaths each year. So just being exposed to somebody smoking in your, in your environment, but you're not an active smoker can lead to these 3,000 lung cancer deaths a year. And I always think of cooking as a biggest source of particulate matter. You know, when you burn your toast and you have that layer of smoke hanging around in your kitchen, you open all the windows and turn on all the fans to get rid of it. You know, that's the visible particles, but the stuff that you can't see is the, is the stuff that we're breathing in and um, is, you know, passing through our lungs into our circulatory system. And other particles are the resuspended house dust, the pollen, and the pet dander. Um, for those of you living in California, the pollen in Atlanta has got to be the worst in the nation. Um, I've never seen anything like it. So when I talk about ventilating, uh, it's not something you can do here in the uh, pollen season because uh, it would create a worse problem than just living closed up in your home. So nitrous oxides like nitric ox oxide and nitrogen dioxide are associated with combustion sources like cooking stoves and heaters. Um, and this is especially true for, or for gas stoves. So one of our concerns in our study in Guatemala is we give people gas stoves is what it, what's it doing to the nitrogen dioxide level? So we're actually looking at that. Um, the cleanest stove is an electric stove, but people like to cook with gas. If you have a gas stove that's not properly functioning um, and not uh, burning a blue flame, but more of a or orange or red flame, that means it's not completely combusting and it could be producing a lot of nitrogen dioxide, so it needs to be checked. And the same for your furnaces if you have gas furnaces. So these indoor levels can also be influenced by high outdoor levels, like uh, living by uh, traffic sources near the freeway, um, where you have a lot of um, uh, traffic pollution. And, and the, the NOx or the nitrogen dioxide, nit nitric oxide, really are respiratory irritants and aggravate asthma. There's been a lot of studies in LA of children outside um, playing, uh, doing their PE and they're uh, on heavy smog days and low smog days. And um, it's, it is one of the most um, severe um, as asthma uh, irritants that we know of in terms of our air pollutants. So carbon dioxide is something that I found quite interesting because as we're trying to, uh, we're moving into new types of buildings that we try to seal from the outdoor environment and don't have a lot of ventilation, we um, need to think more about how we're circulating the air. And carbon dioxide is increased in small crowd, crowded rooms where there's people are breathing and it's also increased when there are open flames like candles and fireplaces. And in fact, these levels are higher indoors and may actually cause occupants to grow drowsy, get headaches, or to function at lower activity levels. Now we know with climate change and the increasing temperature, um, you know, global warming, that CO2 levels have increased outdoors um, to somewhere you know, between 300 and 400 parts per million but the maximum indoor CO2 levels is much higher, it can range from, depending on where we are, um, you know, a thousand in classrooms, 2000 in bedrooms and 4,000 in cars. So, you know, in a sealed car that's recirculating air and we're just breathing our own 
uh, exhaust, we are actually um, increasing our carbon dioxide exposures. So there's been a lot of interest lately in actually carbon dioxide um, and thinking about what that does. Um, in fact, there was one study that was done in indoor air where they measured sleep quality and the perceived freshness of bedroom air. And they found that as people perceive freshness of their bedroom air, um, they actually did have lower CO2 levels in their bedrooms and reported um, the people that had higher CO2 levels reported that they were sleepy in, and had um, difficulty concentrating compared to those who, for instance, had less CO2 exposures inside their bedroom. So, you know, one of the recommendations is to keep the bedroom door open, crack the window um, to let the air circulate within your home. The next one is household odors and gases. So volatile organic compounds or gases um, that contain a variety of chemicals and they're emitted from either liquids or solids. And uh, they are generated, and I've studied them in, in Guatemala, I wrote a couple of papers on them from cooking from wood smoke. Uh, they could be from smoking and uh, they could be from cleaning and personal care products or from indoor chemical reactions of two pollutants that combine to form VOCs. They're in our outdoor air from traffic pollution, or they can off-gas from building materials. So um, these VOCs could, um, could be in our cleaning products. They could be generated from candles. And um, the, the, the short-term effects could be that you have headaches, asthma attacks, some respiratory you know, tightness of your chest, dermatitis or mucosal symptoms. But there have been um, some of these VOCs, the long-term exposures can lead to risks of cancer. And there are three main pathways. So it's not just breathing it in. You can ingest them through, um, through different foods or you, they can be, if you're using a spray that contains a lot of VOCs and it aerates into a mist, you can um, have dermal contact as well. Um, so one of the, big um, sources of VOCs is air fresheners. And a lot of people use air fresheners to make things smell better inside their home. They may be actually using them to cover up mold, the smell of mold or dampness or cigarettes. And, um, you know, over uh, two thirds of the population uses air fresheners and deodorizes at least once a week. And these air fresheners admit over a hundred different chemicals, including terpenes such as limonene, you know, that fresh citrus smell, alpha pinene, that piney smell. So all of these things kind of smell good, but along with the smell good uh, come formaldehyde, benzene, toluene, and xylene, which are uh, carcinogens. And um, semi-volatile organic compounds, which are the phthalates or the plasticizers. So these air fresheners can also react with indoor air oxi oxidants like ozone, and hydroxy radicals and nitrate radicals, and that, that generates formaldehyde. Um, and I don't know, maybe some of you are very uh, aware of chemicals and, and, air, and sensitization to chemicals, um, but I have a, an allergy to a specific um, preservative and a lot of chemicals. So I always try to read the ingredients, but companies are not required to disclose all the ingredients. So I downloaded an, an app onto my phone um, that I can read the ingredients listed on that so I can know what I'm actually buying. And even the green and organic fresheners still emit VOCs like Simple Green, which has a lot of pine in it. So um, to kind of co co to counterbalance this, a lot of fragrance free, free policies have been implemented in workplaces, schools, and hospitals so that we're not um, you know, emitting, it's not just that Perfumes may cause people to sneeze and have, you know, runny eyes or have allergies, but it, they're actually carcinogenic and toxic. This article is a very good article. Um, so when I share the presentation, it, it's quite an interesting article about air fresheners and indoor built environments. So formaldehyde is... Um, uh, can, is formated uh, through secondary processes and it, occur, it can occurs indoors through reactions with ozone and terpenes. That's the most common VOC. And um, the sources are from 
combustion processes like smoking, heating, cooking, candles or incense burning. But the major source is really from building materials that emit formaldehyde like woods and furnitures that have these formaldehyde based resins, uh, typically in particle board, ply, plywood and fiberboard. But formaldehydes in just about everything you can imagine, including cosmetics and, um, and nail varnishes, electronic equipment, and photocopiers. Someone mentioned radon, and um, having moved to Atlanta, it's something I've thought about where we have a lot of granite um, underneath the ground. It's very much built on granite. But gran um, radon is the leading cause of lung cancer among non smokers. And um, it can get into the building through infiltration from the bedrock. Um, so if you have a cracked foundation or you have um, sump pumps or windows in your basement, it can actually infiltrate into your basement and then get into your hot water heater and it comes out in the shower water. So it's colorless and odorless gas. It's from the decay of, of radioactive element uranium found in different types of soils and rocks. And um, the link down below is the National Radon Safety Board and it gives you names of places for testing. You can put test kits into your basement. Um, they do have fast acting and long acting test kits where you can check and see. And then they actually there's remediation for radon, um, whether it's through filtration or sealing um, the area. I, I need to do that. I, I have to confess, I'm worried about radon in my house. I haven't done it yet. So this will motivate me um, as I hope it motivates you. So pesticides, 80% um, of most people's exposures to pesticides occur indoors. And there are dozens of pesticides found in the air inside homes. And these can be you know, uh, chemicals that kill termites, insects, rodents, molds, disinfectants, and uh, herbicides. And these pesticides deposit onto building materials, um, carpets, textiles, and cushion furniture, and they can serve as reservoirs for years. And we also have um, uh, lumber that we use for constructing um, outdoor seating areas, decks that have been impregnated with um, different types of termiticides um, to keep the wood protected uh, or coated that include pesticides. And pesticides can be taken up through the skin, through ingesting or through inhalation. And there's so many pesticides, I could not even begin to scratch the surface, but there's different types of pesticides that can have short acting effects and be irritate, irritant. They can have damage to the central nervous system and the kidney. And then there's long-term pesticide that can cause a risk of cancer. So the short acting ones or the long acting ones that actually, the long acting ones, a lot of them have been eliminated, but um, can actually, you know, deposit in our fat and live for decades inside of us. And then um, the heavy metals like arsenic, chromium, cadmi cadmium, and lead are the most commonly found in indoor air. And um, they are both carcinogenic and non-carcinogenic. I think as nurses, we probably all know um, about lead, especially if we're trained in public health nursing to go and respond to elevated blood lead levels in children and how to remediate the um, environment that in which the child lives. Um, but the common sources are infiltration from outdoor, whether it's through dust and soil, since these heavy metals deposit in soil can live there for decades, whether it's a, a source through smoking, um, or uh, fuels that are used that contain um, different heavy metals and building materials. Um, there was a while ago, they had uh, arsenic impregnated wood that was being used on playgrounds. This was like a couple of, couple of decades ago that they discovered and had to take down all the, remove all the wood. Um, so these are the kinds of um, heavy metals that are of most concern, but there are certainly others. So let me ask you now to, uh, a quiz. How much time do people spend indoors on average? And I put pre-pandemic because I think we're all about 150% indoors now for not working in a hospital. So just um, 
maybe put in the chat what you think it is. Um, do you think it's 30% indoors, 50, 70, or 90? I think I can see the chat. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Okay, somewhere between, set, people are going, oh, okay, 70 and 90, very good. So it's 90, we spend 90% of the time indoors uh, between work and home and you know sleeping. And uh, we only spend 10% of, of our time outdoors, which is why we really need to think about our indoor air quality. Can I so say what's something in, quickly? Oh, sorry. Yes, uh-huh, sure. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just, it's an interesting point because, um, I feel like I actually spend more time um, outdoors now since the pandemic because it's safer. Right. I guess it would depend on what you're doing. I know as a professor, I'm in my, my home office like more than I've ever been in my, my entire life. But if I were able to run around outdoors, yes, it is safer. Um, I don't, I'm not going into shopping malls and restaurants. Yes. Yeah, so that's true. You're, you're eating outdoors is more and avoiding closed public spaces. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for that comment. So what symptoms are linked to poor indoor air quality? Um, these are some of the common symptoms, but there are many, many other symptoms. So dryness and irritation of eyes, nose, throat, and skin, coughing and sneezing, shortness of breath. You can develop hypersensitivity and allergies, dizziness, fatigue, headache, and sinus congestion. So these are the most common, but other people... Um, I'm gonna into the next slide, um, talk about two phenomena. Whoops, let me see here, there we go. There's two phenomena. One is referred to as sick build, building syndrome, SBS, and the other one is called building related illness or BRI. And um, these are kind of the symptoms that are linked to the two. And you can see on the left there, on the left we have things that are a little bit more um, not specific. Some of those things are, hard to pinpoint exactly what it might be that caused these symptoms. So mental fatigue, reduced memory. Um, it's, this basically is a, is a complex of symptoms that may, if enough employees in the building manifest this, they would do an investigation of the building to see what it is. But it may be that everyone experiences it, but they can't point, pinpoint it to a single toxin or a single thing. Whereas building-related illness, um, like Legionnaire's disease, um, really is a different type of illness where they've actually um, pinpointed the source of the problem and then can remediate it. So a lot of this um, is, has arisen as we move into very tight, tightly constructed buildings where we can't open our window to let outside air come in and where we're, depending on the HVAC and how it's circulating air. I think one of the things about the pandemic is we probably improved, improved the quality of our air in many places because they're trying to recirculate the air at a higher degree to, to move the air. So this um, would be interesting to follow up and see if it does improve these symptoms in people that feel that they live in these really tight buildings where they're concerned about their circulation. And I'll, at, in, uh, at the end of the slides, I will present a couple of surveys where they actually assess these. So there are basically four steps to improving indoor air quality. And I heard uh, the previous speaker talk about one of them, which is source control. So the most effective way to improve indoor air quality is to eliminate the sources of pollution or reduce your emissions. So if you have something like asbestos, uh, you could seal it or enclose it. Um, you could lay down a new, if you have the asbestos underneath your old linoleum from the 30s, you can have somebody in and come in and put floorboard and tile and it's just under there and you don't lift it up and you therefore you don't suspend the, the asbestos fibers into the air. Um, the same could be done for radon. And as I mentioned, the gas stoves can be adjusted. If you don't see that blue flame on your gas stove, you can adjust it so that you decrease the amount of emissions like nitrous oxides. So source control is a very cost efficient approach to protecting indoor air quality. Um, and it's even more cost effective than increasing ventilation because as you increase ventilation, and open your windows on the hot day, you may turn on your AC and then you have increased energy costs. And conversely, open your windows on a cold day and you have more heating costs. So it can be more uh, cost efficient. 
The second one is improve ventilation. So you want to increase your air exchange rate. That's something that's been done on airplanes. I think they've quadrupled their air exchange rate uh, during the pandemic, um, recirculating the air in the, in the cabin. So this would lower the concentrations of indoor air pollutants in your house by allowing more outdoor air to come indoors. So one of the sayings in environmental health is dilution is the solution to pollution. So you want to really water everything down. So um, a lot of our home heating and cooling systems, especially um, uh, air, you know, these um, furnaces and things like that do not mechanically bring fresh air into the home. They just recirculate. And so that is not going to improve your ex air exchange rate. But opening windows and doors, using window or attic fans, um, running a window air conditioner with the vent control open would increase this outdoor ventilation rate. This might be a completely foreign concept to people living in a fire area where all you want to do is tighten your house and not let um, all the stuff outside get in. But um, when we're not in that and we, you know, situation, this is the way to um, improve your indoor air. The third is to alter the temperature and humidity. So if you have a lot of mold in the bathrooms um, or uh, uh, because thermal conditions can cause reactions of pollutants inside the home, um, if you adjust the relative humidity and keep it with lower relative humidity or not such high temperature, that would decrease the mold in the bathrooms. And um, I'm gonna skip the next one because I didn't finish that sentence. So. Um, and the last speaker talked about air cleaners, which is great because that's another area, right, is you can use air cleaners with HEPA filters. And there are many different models, and um, they can help to remove particles, dust, molds. And um, they're not really designed to remove carbon monoxide, for instance, um, or nitrous oxides. Um, so that's uh, not, you know, they're, they're moving more of the solids in the air. I provided a link down there for understanding more about air cleaners. But as the previous speaker said, the, there, there are a lot of people out on the market now that are marketing ozone generators or ionizers, which are not air cleaners. And um, ionizers can create ozone, which irritates the airways and can cause asthma symptoms among other things. Um, and so they're not recommending them at all. They can also, um, cause the um, secondary pollutants of formaldehyde and actually increase ultrafine particles. And actually, you know, with the CARES Act, we, um, the government provided more than $100 billion um, relief fund to the elementary and secondary emergency uh, relief fund uh, for K to 12 schools because, you know, we have to send our children, we want to send our children back to school, but we want them to go to schools that have clean indoor air and um, that actually improve the air exchange rate. And um, so what's happened is that um, there are a lot, there's a lot of people out there that are trying to um, help schools reopen by providing with um, new systems. And this is just one example, uh, Newark, New Jersey, they bought 4,500 ionizer air cleaners at $7 million and found that they, this ozone was higher inside um, than outside and uh, the formaldehyde levels are higher too. So um, it is uh, something that's, you know, to think about when we think about you know, looking at our, the quality of our school air. Um, there are a lot of smart home sensors and, you know, as we have smart thermostats and smartphones, we also have these sensors on the market. And I don't, I can't advocate for one versus the other, but there are sensors that measure particulate matter, that measure carbon monoxide, of course, carbon dioxide. Um, and there's all kinds of sensors that people are looking at um, that actually um, could be useful for detecting these levels. So I think this is just going to improve over time and maybe we'll ha have someday our smartphone telling us what we're exposed to inside the home. So I just have two surveys here and I'm a fast talker and I'm, We'll, we'll, we will definitely end on time. Um, but this is an occupational health and safety survey from Emory that is um, the one that I found that actually um, asks people that are experiencing symptoms in their environment to complete this survey. 
So, you know, they ask about stuffy air, which might mean a higher CO2 level or moldy odors, or is it drafty? drafty or, um, and then they ask about your past medical history or your current medical history. And one of the things that they ask about is when you're in the building, what symptoms do you experience? And um, they, where's the, there's a question here that says, um, number 11, do most of these symptoms checked above go away with one hour after leaving work? And number 13, if no, do they go away when you're on vacation? So when you're outside of that environment, these symptoms persist. So it's a pretty thorough questionnaire and includes a lot of um, uh, rating the indoor air quality according to season, um, current symptoms, past symptoms, and um, you, you would submit that as an employee, are you exposed to photocopiers or laser printers? And then they would send out somebody from environmental health and safety to assess the environment. Now there's another tool that Barbara Statler shared with me that's um, more, more focused on the home. And this is a, it's an older tool and it's um, something that you might use as a checklist when you go into the home where you actually, uh, you're not really assessing the, the symptoms that the person might have, but you're looking around the home to see if they, uh, the home was built before 1978, which might indicate a lead exposure if they've home tested for lead, do they have a basement? Um, have they, uh, do they have a home rate on ventilation system? So all of these, um, the gas dryer, for instance, is it vented or not? Uh, some of these things you might not be able to tell, like do they have a lead pipe, uh, lead pipes? Um, and so this is a, a, a very uh, kind of short uh, checklist that you could use with your patients if, if you're working in the home to assess their exposures. So I don't know, um, Barbara, do you, um, do you think we have time for this breakout session or given that I haven't been here for the entire, um, I mean, maybe we could, you could provide me some guidance. Yeah, I think, um, let me see the time here. I think we do. I think we could do it uh, just a quick sort of five minutes as opposed to 10, just to get folks talking with each other a little bit. So do you want to guide it or did you want me to? I, I think I would like to, I would like to say that we break into break into working groups and maybe there's one thing that you take away from from this that you want to test or check or makes you concerned. I, I told you I want to go test radon in my home. I have no idea, you know, and so maybe it might be thing, one thing of concern or thing that you might want to change or um, that might be a good starting point. We we'll take five minutes in your smaller groups to just, uh, and then we'll come back and maybe we could use that uh, just chat and say what things we think we want to address. That sounds great. And Anisio, and can you uh, I, um, divide people into just groups of three rather than four? Um, and that way, uh, everybody will hopefully have a chance to say something. And then uh, we'll just bring people back in four minutes. So everybody will have a, a minute plus to talk. Does that sound good? Sounds and good to me. Okay. And the question is, is there one thing in your home that you would like to address based on what you learned today or what you knew already. And yes. Anissa is gonna divide us up. Thank you. Uh-huh. Well, I was by myself, so I'm coming back here. So uh, is anyone in here with me? I can't see anyone. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm in their rooms. Oh, OK. I can put you in a room with other people that are on. OK.
I'm really trying to get my camera to work. <laughs> it's the weirdest thing. Also, your voice was going in and out occasionally. Just I don't know whether that's a, a function of. It's the connection here. I'm actually in a Marriott, in Guatemala City. It should be good, but I don't know what's going on. Uh -huh. I cannot figure out why it's. It says my camera is on, and I cannot make it. Maybe I have to. Maybe it says it's off. It was on before, but maybe I know what it is. Oh gosh. Now it's going to show up. Rooms in a minute. It looks like a lot of people did not wind up going to rooms, so they had to accept that. So they maybe just um, have stepped away. And Lisa, I think I asked you already, but can we share your slides? Hi, we see you. <laughs> now I know what it was. I had an, I don't know what, it, I, now I figured it out. It's too stupid to even confess what it was. <laughs> but here I am. We've all, okay. all been there multiple times. Um, <laughs> it, are, do we have a permission to share your slides with? Um, yeah, I'm just going to remove some of the personal photos that I put in there and then I'll, 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 I'll I will definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm. So are, is everyone back and would everybody like to just kind of say one thing or? Um... No, I don't, I don't think we have them back yet. Oh, okay. We'll be back in 15 seconds. Okay. There we go. No, the folks that are here did not choose to go to a room. Okay. But... I went to a room, but nobody showed up. <laughs> yeah, I was in a room with nobody too. So, but now we've got, Lots of people coming back. Okay. And we, and we can okay, see. Okay, I figured out my camera issue. So here I am now. Um, but um, does anybody want to shout out one thing that they're thinking more about checking into um, as a result of today's? Cat dander. Cat dander. dander. Okay, smart radon. Product. Well, the okay. smart product that, that detects different things. Radon for sure. Yes. M my plug in Febreze. <laughs> 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 Um, if I could just share that, uh, if you Google a radon map of your state, whatever state you're in, you will be able to find maps. And there are lots of areas where there is no radon, just so you know, that radon Absolutely. is particular to areas. And in California, yes, sort of in the foothills, but there are lots of places in California, there's no significant radon yeah I, I looked at the map of georgia and my county is a is the reddest county in the state so that's uh and i don't mean that politically because it's actually blue <laughs> but yeah so it you could look at the map and say i'm not it's not a problem in berkeley or something like that yeah i i, I have an old air filter and i want to check and see if it is an ozone creator I mean, it doesn't say it's an ionizer. So that would be something to look into for me personally. Yeah. I'd like to locate one of the smart evaluators for all the different types of, of chemicals in the home. Um, where's that site? Just Google it. Um, I, I think, let me put that on my presentation that I'll send out. I need to spend a little bit more time. I don't want to give bad advice, but I'm sure the EPA has something or somebody that has evaluated them um, because there are a lot and some are good and some are bad. Thank you. So there were a couple of questions for you, Lisa. Um, and uh, Nancy asked, what, what is the best means of cooking and heating? Well, I hate to say that uh, not a gas stove, which is what I have um, with red flames and problems, but um, the electric stove, you know, um, is the cleanest. And, and um, so I'd like to just share, I just got an induction stove. And yes, yes. Absolutely love it. Just I do. Is it induction? I-N, can you say that again? Yeah, I-N-D-U-C-T-I-O-N. And because um, we're getting rid of all of our propane propelled <laughs> 
uh, appliances so so that will be fossil fuel free induction stoves are they're extremely like they get extremely hot very fast but you can put your hand on them and right and you, you can't burn them because they require special pots to cook with it's a um, but we were looking at induction stoves as a project for household air pollution and in, in different parts of the world, like Nepal and stuff, but you have to have a good electrical supply. Yeah. Um, but yeah, much more efficient. Any other? Um, oh, so, yeah. And for other questions then. Um, I, I, so Nancy also wanted to know about uh, how sustainable the projects in Guatemala are going to be if they are going to depend on people having to buy gas. Um, so yeah. sustainability and affordability. Yeah, so I would just, I mean, it's amazing right now um, that people actually, the, they buy wood in the area we're at. So the cost of wood and the cost of gas are equivalent. And so now that they have a gas stove and the, con the control group, that um, didn't get a gas stove at the end of 18 months, got a gas stove. And we've seen people, um, we've kind of changed the way of people's um, receiving, we have ga the gas trucks, uh, commercial gas trucks are circulating in these areas, selling gas to people. Now there's a lot of controversy about gas because ga gas is a fossil fuel, but it's, um, it's uh, in terms of health consequences, it's actually, you know, what we cook with, right? And so if it's affordable at the level that we cook with, why shouldn't they cook with it too? Um, and so that's kind of the argument people have made that it causes so much death and disability to cook with a solid fuel stove. A solar stove is not gonna meet their needs. Induction stoves are great, but they don't have, you know, electricity that's, um, you know, you need a strong current for an induction stove. So that's not gonna work. So um, to get people to clean at this point, it's a gas stove. Uh, maybe later on, it could be an induction stove or when there is good electricity, but um, it, it is where it is right now. And people are actually, uh, we had you know, people buying gas tanks for birthday presents and Mother's Day for their, their family members because they're prioritizing clean cooking for their, 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 for, for their wives now that they've seen what 18 months of a clean cooking stove does for the wife, not only health, she sleeps in, uh, she um, has more time to engage in other activities. And it's really been a, a routine of time savings and empowerment for the women to have these stoves. So it's, it's been amazing to see that, um, but they can't fully sustain it, but they are sustaining it to the level that they can given their resources. So I had this discussion with Kirk Smith I remember that. I think I was there for that, <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> yeah, and, and he is, yes, rude uh, sometimes, <laughs> as he was for me, because I do, as many of the nurses on this, uh, you know, in the boxes here, we're concerned about climate change. And so um, we're concerned about it by burning wood, and we're concerned about it by burning a fossil fuel. And it seems to me that we need to begin to think about leapfrogging past not going to this bridge you know fuel uh, along the way yeah. and um and you know for climate change sake yeah it, no and and kirk was uh you know he received a portion of the nobel prize for the ipcc first panel on climate change so he he was a climate change advocate but the problem was you you know it, it is a it is a ladder of energy unfortunately and you know in Ecuador, they were able to do induction cookers because they had thermal energy and they could go from thermal to induction. So every country has their own and you know capabilities. And Guatemala afraid was, you know, it was the gas. And um, you know, in, in other countries, it could be induction cookers. And so we do need to move to the next level. Um, and 10 years from now, we'll probably be talking about something else, but right now. We're trying to get the health benefits solidified. And if we can show that there's a health benefit to cleaning the air to 35 micrograms per meter cubed, then we can say, okay, that anything that gets you to that, please, no more wood stoves with the chimneys. That just is not gonna cut it. So um, yeah, but I'm all for the climate. Yeah, no, we're, <laughs> we're always 
Thank, thank you for a wonderful talk. I'm sure that everybody really appreciated the work that you're doing and the science that you're bringing to us, the evidence, just fabulous. And um, thank you, Barbara. We hope that you'll get your radon checked. <laughs> I know, I'm glowing. <laughs> thank you. And in your future, uh, okay. really just, just terrific having you. And I'm gonna uh, move on to our,